Hey everyone, Tommy here from AI and Games, and 2020 is coming to a close. And so I thought, given it's the end of the year, I thought I would come emerge once more from behind the camera um, and actually show you what I look like. And uh, I thought it would be good maybe to reflect on the, the episodes that have come out this year, talk about some of the games that I've played, some of the episodes that have released, uh, give a little couple of hints about what's coming in 2021, and also answer some questions sent in by you. First of all, I hope you're all safe and well wherever you are in the world, particularly as 2020 continues to be a tough year for everyone. I live in the south of England, and so I'm currently in the tier 4 lockdown that's been imposed as a result of the recent kind of COVID developments we've had here in the UK. Um, I think it's safe to say that, like a lot of other people in the UK, I'm pretty tired, and I'm also very angry at the state of this country and the incompetence and arrogance of our governments and how they've handled this situation, but my focus right now is trying to stay positive, you know, for myself, for my family and, and for everyone else out there. And also, I'm trying to recharge. Like, I think I'm usually tired of it this time of year as it is, um, given, you know, work that I do outside of YouTube. But also making these videos is quite a time consuming process. And um, yeah, it's been kind of tough trying to recharge those batteries. It's taken more effort than usually it would at this time of year. Um, so yeah, it's been it's been a slow and gradual process, but we're slowly getting there, I think. So before we get to the questions, let's take a moment just to kind of go over. I'm going to kind of give you like a highlight reel of some of my favourite episodes from this year, talk a little bit about the channel's growth and, you know, Patreon and a few other developments along the way. So looking back, it's been a bit of a crazy year for the show. It's been the biggest year in terms of growth. More views have came to the channel than ever before. We passed the 100,000 subscriber count. The channel received a creator award, it's also now received channel verification, so it's got the little tick on it, which is kinda nice, but it's also been one of the most varied years in terms of outputs, looking at corporate and academic research, visiting new genres of games we've not seen before, but also revisiting some of our more popular topics to celebrate some big milestones. So let's start with the numbers. The channel's had over 3 million views this year, and just over 50,000 subscribers. That's a pretty big deal, given that the channel has had around 8 million views in its lifetime, and we're sitting just shy of 150,000 subs as I record this video. So hey, if that growth could be maintained, that would be great, though I'm not sure it can, to be honest, and I'm not going to hold myself to it. I'm just really happy people are turning up and watching this stuff. I'm very pleased with the breadth of content on AI and games this year. Even though I skipped January with my first release being Alpha Star in February, followed by Facade in April, it was nice to start the year with these more research-focused topics, and both of them have been fairly popular, with Facade being a very pleasant surprise, now sitting as my third most watched video of 2020. This was then followed up by a fairly exciting period of popularity, where for the 50th episode of the series I went back to Alien Isolation, followed by Splinter Cell, The Last of Us, Command and & Conquer, and City Skylines. Now, as I mentioned at the time, I had no intention of going back to Alien Isolation. But over the years, there was stuff I'd learned about the game that would merit a second episode, and I like to think I've got a little better at making these videos since the first one came out back in 2016. So it was a chance to have my final say on the game and close the chapter for me personally. But I'm also very happy with that series of videos during that period, especially City Skylines, which is the fourth most watched video of the year, and I'm keen to do more non-combat based AI in games in the future. But this has also been a year with greater insight into how these games are made, with our exclusive on the workings of indie game BPM bullets per minute, and of course my two collaborations with Ubisoft on The Division 2 and Watch Dogs Legion. I'm very proud of these projects, and I think they came out really well. And it's great to be able to have an open discussion of some of the bigger challenges faced by the development teams on these titles. I really appreciate Phil, Martin, Liz and Yuri taking time out of their schedules to chat with me, and for us to get more insight into the work that they're doing. And of course a special thanks to Jean Morange and his colleagues at Ubisoft who've been very supportive of my ideas and have been great to work with throughout the year. I've really spent 2020 unpacking the inner workings of some exciting projects. We had 9 AI in games episodes, 4 Ubisoft collaborations, making for a pretty strong output. I'm quite happy with the range of stuff we looked at, ranging from these smaller indie titles to big exclusive stuff, but also been able to stretch out beyond combat focused AI with Facade and City Skylines being more of the type of content I want to explore in the future. 
And of course, outside of the main show, we had two episodes of AI 101, two design dive videos as well, the NPC livestream interview series in the spring, which also had a great response, and I did dabble a little bit more in live streaming on YouTube and Twitch, which I can never seem to maintain any sort of consistency with it, because I'm more beholden to making sure that the main show is consistent rather than doing like weekly Twitch streams or stuff. And I think that kind of sums it up, because in saying all of this, I'm, I'm very tired. It's been a tough year to maintain a steady release schedule, especially with everything else going on out there. And I need to work other jobs around this content production schedule, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later. But it's also been nice to see older episodes get some love. The top 10 for the year shows the original Alien Isolation video riding high in the number 2 spot. And in fact, if it weren't for the new one, it would have been number 1 again. But we also see the Halo Wars 2 episode was my 5th most popular video, the design dive on Doom 64 at number 6, those pesky Dark Souls design dive episodes in 7th and 9th, and Goldeneye coming in at 10th after having a kind of second surge of popularity over the summer. And so with all that said, what does 2021 bring for the channel? Well, there are already 4 episodes of AI in games in development, plus 1 episode of AI 101. Many of these are previously voted for by patrons, and of course, if you're helping support the show, you always have a good insight into what to expect over the next couple of months. But hey, next up on the docket, after we made a big swing over to AAA with Watch Dogs 2 and the exclusive on Legion, we're going into some very indie territory. First up, we have Unexplored, a game that received much love upon its release in 2017, receiving glowing reviews for its PC release over in Rock Paper Shotgun, and was shortlisted as a Game of the Year contender by PC Gamer. Unexplored is a top-down roguelike that is unique in how it generates dungeons by crafting this layered, multifaceted space within which your own stories play out. Unexplored focuses on generating mission spaces from which it can build levels, and it is still relatively novel compared to similar games. Plus, there's a sequel to the game currently in development, and is in a playable alpha state, and I'm hoping we can find out some more about the big changes and innovations happening under the hood. And in keeping with the roguelike theme, we have an exclusive insight into the creation of Ultima Ratio Regum, a game that procedurally generates not just the entire world, but its culture as well. The religions, political affiliations, family crests, personal and countrywide histories, unique dialects and tribes, and all sorts of tiny bespoke details that still to this day blows my mind. I recently sat down with the game's creator, Dr. Mark Johnson, to discuss the highs and lows of spending 10 years of his life putting together this ambitious yet very personal project. AI 101 will be back soon, and just in time for me to talk about the much beloved franchise The Sims, and I have some stuff spinning around right now for episode 60, which should prove a lot of fun. Plus, Design Dive will be making its return in 2021. I only made two episodes this year on Alpha Star and Doom 64, and I know a lot of people have been asking when that series is going to come back, and there are several entries of the series I've been slowly working on in recent months. Now, of course, in order for all of this to happen, I'm indebted to my Patreon community. As you might imagine, this is a time-consuming show to produce, and quite often I can find myself stuck in a rough patch where videos are not materialising as fast as I'd like. So knowing I have that financial support is really helpful. The summer was actually a crazy period, given from April to July I released 5 AI and Games episodes and an AI 101, and it was thanks to them for seeing me through it because between Covid and other factors, I'd lost several bodies of contract work, and actually, financially, things were a little tight. I was effectively unemployed for a little while, so I figured I'd put that time and energy into making more videos instead. And in fact, I took on a new job in the summer to help make my life a lot easier, hence that's why video production has slowed down a little bit since August. And in fact, the Patreon campaign is on a bit of a downward spiral of late, which is to be expected to some extent given the current economic climate but it's lost around one third of its total value since the summer, with only five new patrons joining since October. And that's a bitter pill to swallow after working very hard trying to build it up, especially when a lot of other patron-funded shows of a similar size are supported a lot better than this one. It's a little worrying, but you know, don't get me wrong, I'm extremely grateful to everyone who's supported the show over the years, and hey, if you need to put that money elsewhere or simply decide to stop supporting AI in games, that's fine. I mean, thank you so much for supporting my work. So yes, as always, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters who've been really great to hang out with on the Discord server. And of course, if there is another part to the Discord server that isn't just for patrons, so if you want to come and hang out with us, the link's in the video description. But it's been great to chat with them and also to get some of their insight and some of their enthusiasm for some of the videos that I'm developing. And I'm going to work more on 
new ideas for like how I can better engage with that community. Um, also got a couple of ideas for some new merch that I wanted to make because I thought oh, that'd be quite fun. So, but I'm always open to listening to new ideas. So if you like the show and you've got some ideas about what I could be doing, or even if it's part of the Patreon, do let me know in the comments. Um, and if you do want to support the show, check out Patreon, check out the YouTube um, membership uh, or Twitch subscriptions, you never, whatever. And uh, yeah, also check out some of that Merc stuff when it goes live next year. Now, what I'll do is I'm going to round off this video with some questions from all of you. Uh, so thanks to all my patrons who submitted a question via the Discord server, um, as well as everyone over on the YouTube community tab. So let's take a look at some of these and answer them as best as I can. Patron Rick O on Discord was asking about what I think is going to be like the big innovations, particularly in for AI in the context of live of online um, service oriented games and like uh, cloud powered games, and particularly uh, Microsoft Flight Sim re references there is a big push where you have this whole Earth that you can navigate across at the cost of moving everything over to the cloud. Do I see that happening more for AI in non mass in non massively multiplayer games, um, where you can no longer even play offline because say all NPC AI is in the cloud. And then also Rick actually then posits it from another direction. Um, how long do I think it will be before we see a streaming only game and what effects do you think this will have on AI now that host system constraints no longer apply? Like that's kind of an interesting element of like the holy grail I guess for AI developers is having the opportunity to have those CPU and memory um, constraints lifted from them. I mean it's interesting you know Nowadays, we're not hearing it as intensively, but certainly a lot of the episodes where I've looked at games dating back to the PS3, Xbox 360 era, like CPU and memory constraints was very much the, the challenge of the day. And I think there's some really exciting opportunities there with the idea of moving games entirely into the cloud, but I don't see it happening that soon, to be honest with you, because I think one of the biggest issues that we have is that you're dealing with games that have to be built entirely within that ecosystem from the get-go. So, you know, when you think about it, when a game goes into production, you've got to have a look at what those target specs are going to be, what those hardware uh, specs are going to be, and they're going to lock in at the start. It's why you never see a game that is really pushing, like, the, the, the overall limits of, or really exploiting any of the benefits of the PlayStation 5 or the Xbox Series X now, because all the games that are coming out on it were actually originally locked in for older machines. And so I think getting to a point where you're actually going to have a game that's like, right, we're locking in for a fully cloud-driven experience. Um, that's something I think is still going to be a couple of years away. And I think I will, I mean, I say that, you know, fully acknowledging that Microsoft Flight Simulator is that game. But I think a lot of it really comes down to um, whether there's an ecosystem that's going to support it. Like, funnily enough, I think if there was one company that should have really came out and shown this is how you can change the way in which we build games and then these new affordances that emerge as a result of this type of technology, this is the sort of game that Stadia should have came out and announced um, at the time they were announcing the hardware. Not, they're probably going to announce it a year from now and nobody cares at this point. Like, Stadia's kind of had its moment already, which is kind of, <laughs> which is kind of typical of Google products, I guess. He says, staring at his YouTube platform. <gasps> but just thinking about it in the context of offloading parts of those processes onto the cloud, I think we're going to see more and more of this. So Flight Simulator does this, but even games like... Um, we know we looked at Shadow Mode and Killer Instinct like a couple of years ago, or even um, Forza's Drivatar systems, which we're finally going to do a video on in 2021. Um, those actually offload a lot of the AI training elements over to the cloud. And then once that workload is done, it means that downloading it onto the actual device for gameplay um, is a much more streamlined and easy process for the player. And I think that would be a really cool thing to see more of that, where more complex decision making is happening at cloud level. And then it's able to say, right, well, here, we've offloaded all those concerns. And I think having that in something like a real-time strategy game or like a tactics game of some sort, I think that'd be really, really cool. But yeah, it's going to be an interesting thing. I think the idea of a game that is entirely online has the reluctance or, or you know, backlash towards that has really been cut down more and more over the last few years. So I can certainly see something like that coming in this generation, but an entirely streaming built game around that ecosystem. I think we're still a few years away from that. Yeah, certainly a scale of like a lot of the AAA titles we're seeing right now.
Next up we have patron Mike, I mean he's a patron and his name is Mike, over on Discord and he also asked me is there any research being done to see if the new hardware, you know, i.e. ray tracing, could be used to enhance AI or use spare GPU power to run AI. Like one of the really interesting things that's actually emerging is the changes to a lot of the CPUs as well as the GPUs. So one of the big things that everyone noticed a few years ago was a, a massive um, kind of adoption of graphics cards for the purposes of training uh, deep learning models because GPUs are very much built towards, I mean, let's face it, a GPU is essentially just another processing unit that is designed to work specifically on specific types of instructions. In this case, it worked. It works very well on matrix mathematics, which is so much of that is essentially what a lot of machine learning is built upon. And of course, graphics programming. Um, so there was this huge push was everybody was buying in all these GPUs to go and use them. Um, and I think one of the interesting things is that CPUs are now changing as a result. So in fact, like the new 10th generation of Intel chips are now actually being built to enable um, much more of this uh, asynchronous um, execution where whenever there's a particular um, job that's being passed in from a game or whatever other piece of software, it figures out I've got specific parts of my chipset that are designed to be exploited in these situations. So, you know, typically we think of CPUs for traditional scalar computation. Um, whereas here it's like, all right, we actually now have these dedicated like matrix. They actually even refer to them, I think, on the AI chips, on, on the Intel chipsets as AI um processing components because it's essentially right well it's built for matrix math all right cool so it's expediting that so i think there's a lot of real scope there you're already seeing like those kind of exploits of, of deep learning technology being used in those spaces but i think you're going to see a lot of um work being used not only to try and push ai computation through your graphics card but also pushing it through these new cpus particularly if they maybe even have an onboard graphics card like an intel card that has an onboard graphics card that isn't being used right now because you're using your gpu could it actually find a way to then pass extra ai computation through the dedicated graphics card on the cpu next up sticky fingers on youtube asked me do i believe in gravity yeah I'd say I do. I think about it a lot. It really weighs down on me at times. Joseph Bio over on YouTube asked, more aliens? Probably not. Um, so as we know, like episode 50 was this big, it was a big um, kind of watershed moment for me because I thought, wow, I've done 50 episodes of this. And as I mentioned already earlier in the video, I had no real intention of going back to Alien over the years. I'm very much of a, of a mind of looking at a particular game, talking about the interesting elements of its implementation, talking a little bit about the technologies underneath it. And then I move on. Like, I don't really have an affinity for any one game um, and say, oh, hey, well, I really love this game. So let's keep doing more videos about it. In fact, you might have noticed, I never actually tell you what I think about the games when I make these videos. Um, and so, yeah, like, as much as this channel is is largely known as that channel that does Alien Isolation videos, at the same time, I'm not beholden to it. And I don't really think, at present, there's nothing on the docket. There's nothing that I'm looking at the game thinking, oh, we could do another episode about that. Like, I think the more recent episode uh, that we did earlier this year, I think that was kind of a nice iteration and kind of culmination of everything that I've looked at when I looked at that game um, over the last couple of years. So I know I've, I've, I've even seen those comments so like, hey, couldn't you have done more about this or done more about that? And it's really down to whatever I think I can cover in the video at the level of technical detail that I really want. So I figured, hey, I'm really happy with episode 50. For the time being, that's it. But never say never. Loy71 on YouTube asked, what do you think of the AI things getting standard in the near future? I'm thinking of the unique NPCs in Watch Dogs 3, or you know, Watch Dogs Legion, as a possible example. Like I think Watch Dogs Legion, I'm saying this now, um, after we released the video, I've actually went away and played more of it because I'm actually trying to finish it. And one of the things I'm finding really interesting is there's a lot of scope for iteration, improvement, but also new ideas that emerge because you have that generative system in play. Like, I think one of the interest, the most exciting things about Watch Dogs Legion is it's a proof of concept. Someone's went out and went, hey, look, you can do this. And it certainly it was really interesting to see that video bouncing around on Twitter a little bit from a lot of other developers who worked in Ubisoft or outside of it who were really excited. Like, this is the sort of thing that we've been wanting to see someone be able to pull off. And to do it at this scale is really exciting. And so certainly one of the things that as one of the things I feel is a responsibility for me and from my channel 
is that if I'm communicating how this is happening, and there's other mechanisms that do this, you know, GDC and other game development kind of conferences and avenues, they, they all provide more technical detail, but being able to get out there at a high level and talk about this stuff to a broader audience, I think that's a really great way to kind of advocate to people these ideas are plausible. It just requires a lot of time and effort and dedication in order to really pull it together. And we saw that when I did that episode, because um, we, we had Martin, Liz and Yuri all come on and chat with me, and each of them are responsible for different segments of that whole system system and making that a reality. But I do think in amongst all that, I think the idea of character generation, I think that's really exciting. Um, I really would love to see more in open world games that are actually, there was a point that was made I think during that episode where we talked about the idea of players actions being reflected back upon them. So you know this is something that like the nemesis system in Shadow of Mordor advocated for and then it's never really been embraced as aggressively as that ever since. Like Watch Dogs Legion does it to some extent because it reflects actions that you do back against you so it gives context for why characters don't like you in London. Oh because you keep doing this particular thing and it upsets them or something like that. Like I have one character now in Watch Dogs Legion I think I've put in the hospital six times and it's just different. One of I see them out in the street and another one of my operatives goes oh yeah one of my buddies put you in hospital. Here we go. But outside of all that, going in a completely different direction, one of the things I'm really excited to see is the use of machine learning for uh, real-time control problems. So we've kind of talked, I'm going to finally talk about this this year, but um, you know, machine learning has been used in the context of things like uh, the Forza Drivatar system. Well, that's been around for a few years now, and it's a very different style of control because I think the fidelity in getting that to where they wanted, the technology wasn't really there 10 years ago when, you know, really Drivatar and Forza were really kind of kicking off. Because bear in mind, that is actually a research project that emerged out of Microsoft Research in Cambridge before it actually moved into the games. But we've seen games like uh, MotoGP is now using deep learning for having like a com completely machine learning driven racers. And this is really exciting because you're seeing that level of control over the racetrack, over handling all the, the elements of the physics of that game to the point that so yeah, I'm actually showing you some footage right now, and it was so difficult to record this because compared to the AI racers, I am terrible at this game. It, but yeah, I'm kind of excited, like, because if you look at some of the other episodes I've covered in recent years when we looked at things like Sea of Thieves and the underwater movement for the sharks, but also I looked at Horizon Zero Dawn and how they get the glint hawks, um, you know, how do they get those characters to work? Like, those are really complex problems that are actually more reliant on being able to assess it in a more continuous real-time fashion and it's not something that traditional AI is built to support that well so I think actually seeing machine learning innovations in that space is really exciting. Tom Oakley over on YouTube asked me a fairly large question but I'm going to kind of distill it down to its key point. I'd be curious to see you do some sort of teardown analysis of the AI in Cyberpunk, maybe speculate on why it's broken in many, the NPC and combat interactions. Um, you know, really interested in kind of having me, someone with a bit of a background in that space, been able to take a crack at that and be able to assess it. I mean, so first things first, like I generally don't want to do, a, um, I've actually, I remember many years ago, back when this channel was starting out, I really pondered the idea of doing videos where I take a crack at a game and talk about what's wrong with it. But I never actually did this. And one of the reasons I decided I was never going to do it was I felt that's incredibly disrespectful to the developers. I think there's a huge problem that exists within um, the discourse around video games, that the reality of the production is never really properly discussed openly. I think we're quite quick to slam these games and kind of talk about what the problems are with them without really talking about the fact that actually probably some of the issues there, like, you know, there's bugs in it. The QA found all those bugs. The developers probably know those bugs are there, but whether they were given the time or space or resource to actually do that, or whether even the game was actually, during production, there was enough scope to actually enable for some of those, like some of the systems necessary in order to really get those characters to behave the way that they need to is actually there. So, in fact, like in amongst all this, I actually decided to go and have a look at Cyberpunk. I did go and download it. I've been playing it on one of the original patches when it came out. And the thing is, yes, it's clearly very buggy, and I imagine that the developers have got a lot of work to do to clean that up. Um, that game was shipped months before it was ready, and the reasons for why that is, I'm sure, is very much something that CD Projekt knows very well, and they're just trying to keep that quiet. But when I look at that game, I see a game that isn't complete and requires 
more work to really flesh out the open world elements of it. Certainly I thought the open world AI is largely incomplete and it might be down to the fact that simply the, the, the team has not had the time or resource in order to really put that together. That said, I do actually, I started playing Cyberpunk because it's been another of these very loud, very tumultuous periods of, of gaming discourse where we talk about another big game and all the nonsense that emerges around this and it really annoyed me this one looking at cyberpunk um so i'm gonna have i do actually have something to say about this and you'll probably hear more about it early next year design dives coming back and i'm feeling grumpy Ryan Kilgore over on youtube asked can you make a video on the application of different machine learning techniques in video games um, yeah, we could probably be looking a little bit more. I think AI 101 is going to start moving gradually more towards machine learning over the next year or so. Um, I do want to actually take more time to kind of begin to demystify machine learning. And particularly now, because, because it's actually becoming more prominent in video games, now is the time to really start cracking that. Um, particularly for students or, you know, just anybody, aspiring devs, or even just anyone who's just kind of curious, to really begin to demystify this process. Because so much of the early phase of this channel has been pointing out that machine learning historically hasn't really existed in a lot of commercial video games. But now it's time to really start cracking into this and start showing where it's being used, how it's going to be used, and how you could actually go about this, actually exploring it and adopting it yourselves. Last up, Atari Com over on YouTube asked, what was the most exciting development or application of AI this year? And also, given the rapid advancements in computing power, is it likely we'll ever see neural networks used to progressively train NPCs to adapt to individual playing styles? So to answer the second question first, this is actually something that's already been largely explored in academic spaces, and even to some extent in corporate spaces, the idea of using... Um, imitation learning based on, in, on existing play traces to then reproduce a particular behavior. Now, using that to replicate that, or in some cases actually being used to counteract it, like even my earliest research in kind of machine learning like 15 years ago was all about training um, characters to uh, essentially maximize or kind of focus their behavior specifically on one type of character or player and like how they were performing in a game. So. Like, I think a lot of that already exists, that technology already exists, and I think one of the interesting parts is how that gets from being um, a research concept or something that works really well in a very small prototype to being an outright reality where it becomes part of a larger game, a larger commercial game, um, and people are really able to interact with those systems in a more interesting way. I don't know if I have a most exciting development or application of the year, although I was really... Um, jazzed to see uh, the recent uh, NeurIPS conference, or rather the 2020 conference on neural information processing systems, it's you know, called NeurIPS for short. Um, there was actually some really exciting work there looking at, again, taking an awful lot of these ideas of how we can use machine learning and then applying that in the context of games. And in fact, um, Ubisoft's LaForge R&D unit were talking quite a bit about some of their work they're doing on trying to circumvent the need for navigation meshes uh, by actually getting the systems to train to learn to navigate an environment just by actually f going around the environment. So like, for example, they were using this thing here, but they had the character moving around Hyperscape, which is their kind of um, free to play uh, battle royale game. But you can see here that this is very early phase work. The idea is that they're trying to train a deep learning system to learn to navigate through that environment just by using the controller. So it doesn't need a navigation mesh to tell it how to navigate through the world, but it also begins to learn how to run, how to jump, how to double jump, how to grapple, and then you know actually use the, the mechanics of the environment. Um, just by virtue of exploration as it's learning. And I thought that was really exciting. That was something that um, there's a lot of work in that kind of field. And you know, um, LaForge have talked about it in, on other occasions as well, this idea of can we use machine learning to circumvent existing tools and expedite these processes to help designers in new ways? And that's it for this roundup. Thank you to everybody for sending in your questions. I hope I've answered them, you know, as, as well as possible. I'm going to take a little bit more time off to recharge my batteries, but I'm going to be back in January. Uh, we're going to be back with a new episode of AI and Games. We'll have that uh, unexplored video to you shortly. Um, and then also hopefully we'll have Design Dive not long afterwards. Um, I hope the remainder of your 2020 goes well, however long it might be. I think, you know, probably less than 48 hours by the time this video goes out. But I hope you to continue to stay safe and that you're all well and I'll see you all in the new year. Thanks again everyone. I look forward to seeing you again soon.